Welcome everybody back to our fall season of the Larchmont the Marinick Local Summit. Uh, we have distinguished speakers today. If the other one will come, Shelley Mayer, our uh, senator, and uh, Steve Otis, our representative in Albany. Um, not yet. I think what we'll do though is we'll first start with our um, tidbits. Jeff, would you like to begin? Oh, and welcome our our county executive, George Latimer. Thank you. Um, I'm one of the undistinguished speakers. Uh, I think this year, in my tidbits, I'm going to sprinkle my tidbits in describing neighborhoods around our four-part community. You know, you know, we have two villages, the town, and Rhineck. You know, I like to include Rhineck as the fourth one. And uh, yes, Nora Lucas says thanks. Um, and um, we've had a lot of, uh, there are a lot of neat little neighborhoods and why they got their names and how they were developed. You know, we, we have Oriana and Edgewood Point and Rook and Glen. And I think I've told you in the past, Rook and Glen comes from the fact that the builder, J.C. Moody, was traveling in Scotland and happened to pass this wonderful park in Scotland called Rook and Glen, which rivals Central Park. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start, and there's been a lot of development uh, lately, if you'll notice. There's some uh, buildings going up around the com various communities. And I want to describe a little neighborhood, a little neat neighborhood, that was um, way ahead of its time in, in development. And that is Elkin Park. Um, and some of the old timers here will remember Elkin Park, but this Elkin Park was developed uh, in the, uh, by local GIs coming out of World War II, uh, led by uh, 10 local GIs who were uh, joined by 34 others. And they were led by a man named John Merritt, who became a developer himself, did uh, the, uh, um, uh, developed a lot of houses in Connecticut and so on. And his sister, Mabel Mitchell, ran a real estate outfit called Merritt Associates. Some of the old timers here will remember. Uh, remember uh, Merritt Associates and remember Mabel, who was quite a character. In any event, uh, these GIs each got together and contributed $600 each working capital. They pooled their benefits together to obtain a $500,000 construction loan, GI construction loan, and they went around and searched for land. And they were turned down twice. One of the times was near Boston Post Road and Mayhew Avenue in Larchmont. And finally, they found this rocky piece of land next to the new Central School, because at the time, it was sort of a town dump. The Central School was where the town hall is now. In any event, they bought a piece of land from Benno and Madeline Elkin. And they built 12 buildings and 50 homes. And this was very unique. The town had to, re, had to come up with new zoning and attached housing. And it created quite a stir. My mother told me that everybody was afraid that these people were going to hang their laundry outside. It was going to be, well, if you drive through Elkin Road now, it is one of the prettiest places. Everybody, it's, a, it's unique. You actually own your piece of land, uh, your actual rectangular piece of land. There are easements to go behind the houses to park. Every house has a garage. They were built well with concrete and brick and slate roofs. It is still today one of the most popular places and it has served our community from new young couples to downsizing people to single parents. It is an absolutely wonderful place and there are flowers all over the place. And at the time the place was built, um, and they went out and hired contractors themselves. Well, Benno Elkin gave them back their purchase price of $42,000. And the, the irony of all of this was that Benno Elkin himself was a German immigrant. And this was right after World War II. Um, 
He was a native of Germany. He came to the United States in 1906 to open a branch office of the Frankfurt Metals Company. After World War I, he became chairman of International Minerals and Metals Corporation. He was governor of the Commodity Exchange of New York and was also an advisor to the U.S. government during World War II. And as late as 1969, his wife created a capital improvement fund. Um, and uh, there's a plaque in the circle there, Elkin Circle, commemorating Benno Elkin and his wife, Madeline. And it is a wonderful drive in there if you've never driven in there. Thank you very much. Oh, hey, hey, how much? We're going to have a little different format this morning. We're having a tag team. They're going to pr do their presentation ensemble together. So I'm going to give the um, introductions for both at this time. First, Steve Otis, since he sits nearest to me, uh, serving his fourth term in the state legislature, Assemblyman o Steve Otis had previously served as longtime counsel and chief of staff to Senator Susie Oppenheimer until his election to the assembly. Before that, Representative Otis served as the mayor of the city of Rye for 12 years, from 1998 to 2009, the longest serving mayor in the city's history. He is also a former president of the Westchester Municipal Officials Association, serving on its executive committee from 2002 to 2012. During that time, he got, gained broad experience working with local conservation and flood control groups. In the assembly, he sits on a wide variety of committees, enabling him to be effective on numerous issues affecting local government, education, traffic and pedestrian safety, emergency management, recreation, senior citizens, environmental protection, infrastructure repairs, historic preservation, property tax relief, and matters of concern to women and families. Lots of different committees that deal with all those issues. He's a graduate of Hobart, Hobart and William Smith College, holds a master's degree in public administration from NYU, and a law degree from Hofstra University School of Law. He lives with his wife in, Rye, in the city of Rye. And on to Shelley Mayer. Senator Shelley Mayer was elected to the New York State Senate in a special election in April 2000 and 2018, if you recall. Before that, she served in the New York State Assembly from March 2012. She had previously been chief counsel to the New York State Senate Democrats. For over seven years, she was vice president of government and community affairs at Continuum Health Partners, one of New York City's largest teaching hospital systems. From 1982 to 94, Senator Mayer was an assistant attorney general in the office of New York Attorney General Robert Abrams. She served in the Civil Rights Bureau as chief of the, of the Westchester Regional Office, as the legislative liaison for the attorney general, and ultimately as a senior advisor to him. She served as senior counsel in the National State Attorney General Program at Columbia Law School. Um, Senator Mayer is a graduate of UCLA and has a law degree from SUNY Buffalo School of Law. She lives in, with her husband in Yonkers. And now, the tag team. <laughs> Thank you so much. We each got a mic. Tagging. We each, we each got a mic. So Shelly and I thought that we, instead of the normal thing of each of us just doing a presentation, we'd sort of go, go through some of the issues that were important. But I, I'd say two things. Okay. Uh, that uh, I'd make two, and then I think Shelley might have some opening, opening comments, but two comments. Number one is, of the communities I re represent, Large Mount Maranek is the only community that has something called the summit, and something like the summit. And I wish every community had this, because this is, as you know, such a great resource for all of us to know what's going on and to hear from each other. And so it's, it's nice to be here, up here for once, but I enjoy coming every, uh, every time I can. Um, secondly, I just a reflection about the legislative session. As you know, we have had a very productive legislative year, partially because we have uh, now democratic control of the state senate, so that many of the things that had passed in the assembly over many years uh, now are passing both houses and getting signed by the governor. But it's a very exciting time, I think, from a more historical perspective, which is uh, over the generations, New York has often led the nation on key issues. Going back to uh, the New Deal and when uh, President Roosevelt was Governor Roosevelt, many of the things that this country later followed up with in the New Deal happened in New York under his administration from uh, 19... 
1929 to 1932. And uh, this year, we passed a lot of legislation that is either first or strongest in the nation. And uh, a lot of the reforms that we've done in different areas are going to be followed up on by uh, other parts of the country, which is very exciting. It's a very exciting time to be in state government. And I think that's my, my intro, Shelley. Well, thank you. Thank you for having uh, Steve and I. We are really a tag team. Uh, we work together. Hi, George. I see George back there. Uh, uh, we've worked together for a long, long time, and it is a real uh, benefit for both of us that we have each other as colleagues and friends, and we happen to be on the same floor at 222 Grace Church Street in Porchester, uh, a few doors down from each other. The second thing I have to say is, 745 and the Homic School is a bad combination <laughs> when you're coming from Weaver Street. So I apologize. And the, uh, that being said, uh, it was a fantastic session in Albany from the point of view of our job in government is to get things done. And I have to bring this cheat sheet with me when I go and speak about what we did because, and which is in very small font, because there really is a lot of substance here, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. And Steve and I decided we would sort of just jump through the issues, sort of go back and forth with each other. We, do, we agree about most things, but we don't agree about everything, and we represent different chambers. One thing I want to point out that you know is um, Steve is in the leadership of the assembly, which means that he has a key role in uh, being involved with the speaker about what bills come to the floor and what issues are taken up. So that's one thing you should know that it's really a benefit for us in this district. The second thing I want to say is in the Senate uh, this year, obviously 39 Democrats, we became the majority, a very strong majority, a very diverse majority, a majority that was not only New York City but included suburban members like myself and, and Pete Harcum and Carlucci and six new members from Long Island and there's a very strong uh, group of us who want to make sure that our concerns as non-New York City members are heard loud and clear. And credit to our leader, Senator Andrea Stewart-Cousins, who uh, made a concerted effort to make sure that, for me, I was included as a voice of suburban uh, sort of perspective on many issues, including criminal justice reform, which we're going to talk a little bit about. But I'm going to jump in, if that's OK, first on election reform, which we did right at the beginning. A big deal changes, and I'll try to go through some of them. Early voting, you know, all the other states, so many states had it. We didn't have it. We couldn't get it with the prior uh, Senate majority. We got early voting. It's starting this year, Saturday, October 26th to Sunday, November 3rd at the Mamaronic uh, Town Center you will be able to vote in, in advance of election day. Uh, the rollout, like most new things that are really big changes, is a little, has its ups and downs. That being said, we did not want to delay this early voting. We wanted to get going, get this. Yes, people have to get used to it who never voted early before, but it's an opportunity to expand the number of people who vote. The other, some of the other major voting reforms we did were to uh, begin the process to get rid of uh, the current absentee voting situation where theoretically, or at least under the law, you are supposed to give an excuse for absentee voting. We are moving towards no excuse absentee voting. It's going to require constitutional change, but we are going to basically be able to say, uh, I don't need an excuse. I'm just not going to be there. I'm going to cast my absentee ballot. Uh, we consolidated the primaries, as you know. It's Again, it's a little bit of a sticky situation because we imposed on our local boards of elections the requirement to consolidate uh, these state and local primaries to a single date. The idea is save money and get more people to vote. I suspect the people in this room, you're perennial voters, but we have a whole generation of people who do not vote regularly and who find voting um, Either they think it's irrelevant, or it's too hard, or we're all out of date with it going to some single place and we can't do it on our phone. So we have to, <laughs> we've got to move along with the times here and encourage everyone to vote. So we did a number of things. We made it, uh, 
that we are going to be able to use electronic poll books. So you will not be using that little book that shows your signature the way you signed it 10 years ago or 20 years ago, or in my case, you know, a long time ago with your signature, and they cover it up to make sure you're not copying. We are going to move to electronic poll books so that they can verify you're registered. What if you registered within the deadline but your name is not in the book? And also, what if you moved within the same election district, within the same town, but you're at a different table, as we say? Um, we're going to make these changes. Some of them do require a constitutional amendment, so we started the process. has to be passed twice and then go to the voters. We are facilitating younger voters registering before they turn 18. So they will be able to register in advance. I actually am very much in favor of trying to encourage students in high school to register prior to their 18th birthday, where we have the opportunity to reach them and get them registered. Yes, they may not choose to vote, but we should get them in the process. Um, I'm looking at my things here. Uh, we are moving towards automatic voter registration. We did not accomplish it. We will do it at the beginning of next session. That will be when you go to apply for a license or any other state benefit. If you're going to apply, uh, going to social services, if you're going to Veterans Affairs, any state agency at the front end, unless you opt out, you will automatically be registered to vote. Subject to your own choice of party and all that. But you will be in the system. You can opt not to be. We haven't finished this, but again, this is to make a concerted effort to expand the electorate and include as many people as possible. Um, one big campaign finance change, we eliminated the LLC loophole. That was the rule before that, and this is the example I give. Uh, Steve Otis owns five pieces of real property in Mamaroneck. Each one has a separate LLC ownership. So Steve Otis one, Steve Otis two, Steve Otis three, Steve Otis four. This is, re this is what really happens. Each of these Steve Otis's LLCs was able to give the maximum donation under the campaign finance law. So there wasn't anything wrong with my taking five donations from the Steve Otis properties. But the fact is Steve Otis was circumventing the maximum contribution limit by having these LLCs. Again, we could not get any of these things done with the prior majority. And when we got to be the majority working with the assembly, which had passed these before, we moved right ahead and did these right at the beginning. Many of them passed on a bipartisan basis, and I think that's true in the assembly as well. Uh, that being said, when you vote for something, it's different than when you allow it to come to the floor. And that's where majority makes the difference. Majority decides what issues come to the floor, and we were able to get this group of things. So I'll stop there. No, before. No <laughs> I, 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 would, I would just say uh, around the country you see a lot of efforts to make it more difficult for people to vote and so while we understand it's a good thing here and we actually have had early voting in Porchester for about 10 years in their village elections because of a, a federal court decree but the goal is to increase public participation in the process we're doing it, but it, there, here's a contrast, because around the country, the voter suppression efforts are serious and real, and a lot of states are actually affirmatively going in the opposite direction. It's, it just seems crazy. But why don't we go, I'll go to another, another big topic, which is environmental issues, and it was a big year for environmental issues. I, Nancy Selickson beamed up uh, <laughs> the excitement of uh, the mention of that early, as did Marlene. But uh, as you know, we've passed very important climate change legislation, really the most aggressive in the nation right now in terms of targets by uh, uh, 2050 uh, to reduce uh, our greenhouse gas output by 85%, by 2040 to have us be 100% free of carbon sourced electricity production, which is pretty aggressive. Uh, we're going to have these offshore wind projects, which are very important, uh, more solar. Um, but uh, to uh, put a little reality check on the climate change issue, because I think it's important to state, we passed a good piece of bill with targets. What really it's going to take is a lot of changes in lifestyle, um, either macro, we're going to have to find ways to get offline polluting, causing energy sources, power plants, and replace them with clean energy. 
We're going to have to change in a more dramatic way the kinds of cars we drive. So uh, it's not something I think that we, there's a lot of celebration about it. I think the celebration is actually premature. There's a lot of work to do. Another important category that uh, I'm very involved with and Nancy has been a real partner with, and, and we, had, we had a press conference a few years ago down, um, uh, down by uh, Otter, was it Otter Creek? Uh, Hama, yeah, Hama, that Shelley was at, which is uh, clean water. And New York really has become the leader in the country in terms of clean water programs. Uh, this year we are devoting $350 million to the Water Infrastructure Improvement Act program that many people in this room supported and got started in 2015. And the governor has had now in 2017 2.5 billion, most of it goes to the water grant program, but um, 2.5 billion over five years for a wide variety of very aggressive clean water uh, programs. This year, we added another five-year commitment for an additional 2.5 billion. And so amazingly, the water grant program is now for the first time surpassing the State Environmental Protection Fund. Very exciting. And a lot of this money has gone to Mamaronek Village, Mamaronek Town. Larchmont is applying uh, this year for some grants. And all along the Sound Shore, while it's a statewide program, it is, uh, was designed, honestly, with Westchester in mind. And a lot of the money is going to Westchester, which, which is uh, great. We also passed legislation to ban plastic bags, which some communities had already done. But now we have a statewide ban. There's an option for a more aggressive approach that uh, George Latimer and the other county executives can, can opt in to uh, make it a little tougher. And uh, it's a good thing. It's something I think we all hate those plastic bags. They're really a nuisance. They're bad for the environment. And uh, so I think those are the biggest environmental highlights. And now I'm going to pass on to Shelley for the next topic. It really is hard to pick, and so I know you're going to ask questions and you'll get to some of the things we didn't talk about. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the immigrant community issues. They were quite controversial for, for some, and I, I, I just want to acknowledge and thank uh, the Mimaric and Larchmont community for stepping up and being extremely supportive of the fact that this is a community that is diverse, uh, welcomes diversity, and acknowledges it. Not that everyone agrees with everything we did, and that's the nature of democracy. But that being said, um, there were elements of the state where there was a certain hatefulness component, not just disagreement. And I'm very, very happy that Steve and I represent communities that, while there might have been reasonable disagreement about some of the things we did, it did not degenerate into some of the language that is really very difficult to hear. And if you come on the floor of the Senate more than the Assembly, some of it has shown its head again. Uh, so we did two big things in the area of immigrant uh, protection. Uh, we passed the DREAM Act early on. The DREAM Act is not the same as DREAMers in the federal system. Hi, Catherine. Um, the DREAM Act had to do with uh, eligibility for TAP, the Tuition Assistance Program. So the Tuition Assistance Program is obviously a offset of the cost of tuition. Uh, primarily applicable in uh, for these students in state and City College, City College of New York, and SUNY and Westchester Community College, it would allow a child who basically went through uh, our public school system or our school system here, even if they came undocumented as a young child, but they went through our system, they graduated from high school, now they are accepted into a college uh, that accepts TAP, they will be eligible for TAP. Um, there also is a requirement that they actually stay here. Uh, no, now I'm mixing it up with the Excelsior Scholarship. <laughs> the point I always say about the TAP uh, DREAM Act is this. So I, as you know, I am from Yonkers. I represented Yonkers, and I'm very loyal. So the top students in the Yonkers high schools, valedictorians and salutatorians, are generally these students who came when they were maybe four, five, six, or seven. They are living here. They're, this is their home. They're not going anywhere. And my view is that we should encourage them to become successful members of our community by giving them the opportunity to go to college. Without TAP, these students do not go to college. They just go to work. TAP is the opportunity to go to WCC, 
and then like students in, in my office over time, they then transfer after two years of getting a B average into one of the SUNY schools. This is a path, so we did the, the DREAM Act. The other is, you know, we did the green light, the license bill. That was obviously very contentious uh, as well. But I think it's really uh, an important public safety bill. And I would say that for, I spoke about this bill, I've been a longtime supporter, reading the letter from the uh, police chief of Ossining in support of this bill. So this bill would, creates a new kind of license. Uh, I don't say it's an undocumented license. It's a license for people who do not have a social security number. That's really the thing. It is a limited license, can only be used for driving, cannot be used for travel, cannot be used for voting, obviously, cannot be used for going outside the country. It is simply to acknowledge that we have people who are driving without licenses, without insurance, who run away when there's a little fender bender because they don't want the cops to come. This is a public safety for our communities like Mamaroneck, like Ossining, like Port Chester, where honestly we have a significant immigrant community that needs to drive to get to work, to take their kids to school, to go to a doctor's appointment. So it creates a limited license um, that the details of which are being worked out by the Department of Motor Vehicles that will allow somebody to have a uh, document that is a license that can be used if they show proof of residency. In other words, they actually have to live somewhere, like show a Con Ed bill or a lease, and a birth certificate. It could be from another country, but they have to show a birth certificate. They obviously have to be insured. They have to pass a driving test. And I think generally, we did this prior to 9-11 in New York. You did not need a social security number. It worked fine. Other states, including California and some of the southwestern states have this. This is a, in my opinion, a strong public safety measure. We are being sued, the state is being sued now by some upstate county clerks who don't want to do it. But I think uh, the Attorney General was quite clear the law is constitutional, the law is well drafted, and we believe it will be a safer uh, way to travel around the streets of Mamaroneck, Port Chester, Rye, and the whole Sound Shore. talk about gun safety, which is a huge issue and a really, really scary issue. And I, I just say in reflection, back in the early 90s when I was working for Susie Oppenheimer, she uh, introduced legislation to ban assault weapons and to ban the high capacity magazines before we had the federal ban that was in existence for 10 years. And what is uh, really sobering is that when the federal ban expired in 2004, since that time, the gun industry has sold millions of assault weapon style uh, uh, guns around the country that are out there and it, they're unlikely to be coming back. And so um, it's in a sense, the freakishness of these events uh, affects us all. Some people uh, have, have actually been by, by freak of circumstance at uh, Las Vegas, and then uh, somehow there at, at one of the more recent events to imagine surviving two of these. But New York uh, did something very strong early in each of our tenure in the assembly, which is after Newtown, which was December 2012, in January of 2013, we passed a very comprehensive gun safety bill called the SAFE Act, which is very uh, controversial in some quarters upstate but certainly very much supported in the metropolitan area in the suburbs. Um, and then there were efforts to pass other gun safety legislation over the years stymied by the state senate. So finally this year we had important legislation passed in a number of categories. And some of these are now being talked about in other states and again um, even in, in Washington attempts are being done to pass them a red flag bill, a bill that where you see or a family member or somebody in school sees somebody who is exhibiting dangerous behaviors and uh, we think that there's a risk, you can go to court, it's a legal process, and to have guns taken out of that home, which is uh, a lot of these events are pre previewed by certain behaviors and uh, this is something that is being talked about uh, nationally right now. Um, we eliminated a number of the loopholes for the background check process in New York State. We added a provision where in 
getting a gun in New York State, that we have access to out-of-state me mental health records before allowing someone to get a gun. We banned in New York State the bump stocks, which were used um, in Las Vegas. Uh, the, uh, and we have instituted a gun buyback program that uh, is an important way to try and get some of these guns off the street. But we live in dangerous times, unfortunately, and, and it is even, even larger than all the weapons. There's something unique and something very dark about American culture and where people decide that when something goes wrong, they have to act out in a way where they're going to be violent, use guns, take other people with them. I, I, I'm usually an optimist. This is a depressing area, and I'm not so sure without strong federal action where we're going to be on this, but at least New York is do, taking a strong role, and, and Shelley and I were involved in, in all of the pieces of legislation that passed. Okay, well, keep going. Keep going. Okay, keep going. There's a long Just list. Right. Sorry. Uh, it's hard to know exactly. I keep not being sure where to go next. There's a long list and I want to be sure. But I think uh, one thing in the area of uh, equal rights and women's rights, some of the things we did, uh, many people know, we did the Reproductive Health Act early on. And that was an effort and I think it was uh, mischaracterized, unfortunately, uh, by many people, by some, to take the language of Roe v. Wade and in put it into the New York State law. Previously, provisions about abortion were in the penal law, the criminal law. They belong in the public health law, like other restrictions on health provision, uh, health, any kind of health activity. So we moved, uh, one, we moved the provisions about abortion to the public health law. We took the language of Roe v. Wade and put it into the New York State law. Uh, at the time, I think we were not sure of what was going to happen federally, but we were always concerned that New York's uh, allowance of abortion would ultimately be overturned if Roe v. Wade was overturned because uh, we needed a state protection for the right to abortion. So we have created it. Um, I personally spent a good deal of time in the sort of uh, some of the more conservative parts of my district making sure that people understood we were not doing anything revolutionary. We were doing something to protect what has been the status quo in New York in a way that gave the health department the ability to regulate abortion and take it out of the fear of being criminally prosecuted, which was still in the books. Um, in the area of sexual harassment, we really, really turned a corner. Uh, this was really prompted by incredibly sexual harassment activities by legislators uh, and legislative staff that had really created a climate where the new members of the Senate particularly said we are going to actually take the bull by the horns. We are going to have hearings and allow these women and men to speak up about what happened and then we are going to change it. Not by internal policy, which has always been sort of the Albany way, you know, you fix the little rules here, but we were going to change it in the law. One of the most important things we did, and this is somewhat technical but very important, the standard for proving sexual harassment was different than proving other kinds of discrimination. Currently, if you have a discrimination claim based on race or religion, uh, you, you prove that something happened. It could have happened once, but it could have been serious, and that might be enough to have a finding of discrimination. With sexual harassment, it had to be severe and pervasive. A single incident was not enough, even if it was so offensive and outrageous. So we change the standard from severe and pervasive to be consistent with other ways of proving discrimination. And that means that sexual harassment falls into the regular category of discriminatory conduct and allows people to bring a claim either under the human rights law or under other state law and say that this happened. So that was one of the big changes. Uh, obviously, we changed uh, the climate about sexual harassment dr dramatically by creating a, uh, a public outcry about what had happened and been swept under the rug in Albany. And I really do think it's made a significant change. In some of the other areas, we changed the equal pay laws in New York to say it didn't have to be the word equal, but basically substantially equivalent. So I might not have the same job as a title as Steve, like you know, I might be 
floor sweeper and Steve is cleaning maintenance person. But if the job is the same, the job is the same. And so we have the same job, we have to pay, be paid the same. In another area related, but somewhat different, is the um, Child Victims Act. That was a huge step forward. If you have met any of the survivors of child sexual assault who come as adults and later tell their story, who basically were denied by New York's criminal and civil statute of limitations from being able to bring a claim as adults, uh, we lengthened the civil and criminal statute of limitation and then we created a one year window, which you've all read about because it just opened recently, to allow civil claims as old as they were, you have one year to bring a claim, an old claim. You have a chance to tell your story. You may not win, you have to have the proof, all of that, but this is a validation of people whose claims were not heard in New York and could not be heard. We created this one year window, which I think again, is a, cha a game changer. And this unfortunately was a thing that was stuck in partisan politics, in part because some of the institutional players who were gonna be defendants in these actions really fought back against them. But when the tide turned, it passed unanimously in our chamber. Uh, everyone who had been opposed to it was for it. So who, who can explain? I can explain. Um, I'm gonna stop on that group of things. Maybe I don't know what's next on your list. Well, I'll just mention uh, two other criminal justice items. Criminal justice was a huge issue this year and some reforms, and I think this is another category where we're gonna see the, these uh, trends followed in other parts of this, uh, the country. One is to basically eliminate most uses of cash bail. And so what we had a situation, whether it's the Westchester County Jail or Rikers Island in New York City, where um, a large number of people are there awaiting trial and, in, and incarcerated only because they could not make some bail amount, not because that they were going to necessarily uh, flee, uh, not really based upon the magnitude of their crime. People even with minor offenses, a judge would set normally a, even a small amount, of, a cash bail amount, and they're in jail. And there are some horrible stories of people being in there for uh, actually even longer than, uh, you know, longer than the, the sentence would be or longer than a year. You're only, you know, for a felony, you go to state prison, it has to be more than a year. Uh, and so I think in both of our houses, in both of our conferences, uh, we heard very heart-wrenching stories about lives that had been ruined by these kinds of procedures really based upon uh, the, the pocketbook of people. And so there was a concerted effort to uh, alter this, but it, like many things and all the issues we're going through, these issues get very complex and all the details on how they're done take time. Different people come in with different points of view and different knowledge. And so this was certainly the case on the ca cash bail issue, but we came up with something that, that uh, was a compromise, but I think it is going to do a good job. The other big criminal justice piece that was uh, improved was the right to a speedy trial. And this, again, in a sense, relates to people that are, are in jail. And, and oh, back to the cash bail. If someone is committed, uh, is accused of committing a very dangerous crime, there are still avenues for a judge to hold that person or if there is a uh, likelihood that the person is a flight risk, the judges still have options to retain people. So it's not like everyone accused gets out, which, which would not make sense. But the speedy trial provisions um, are very important, including more transparent disclosure of information um, by uh, the prosecution to the defense and more disclosure by the defense to the prosecution so that information that is going to come out in trial, uh, we're going to have less of the Perry Mason situation where there's the surprise at uh, 58 minutes into the program <laughs> that solves the case. But uh, I think those are good reforms that are going to help around the country. And maybe why don't we close with marijuana? Do you want to do that with both? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, and, and we, we can both we can both talk about this a little. But I, I, I guess um, we did not, uh, we did not legalize uh, adult recreational use of marijuana cannabis this year. Even though there were many people within the legislature that wanted to do that, 
but there was, I think, a sober caution about moving ahead with that. Um, I'll, I'll give you one piece of this that I'll throw in, then I'm going to hand this over to you to talk more about, maybe talk about vaping, which is uh, there are two elements to this issue, and it is rare that you have an issue for which the two major sub-issues don't really merge in the discussion up in Albany and the discussion among colleagues. One is the pros and cons of whether it's good to have more people having e adults, easier access to marijuana for, for recreational purposes and the health aspects of that, and that's a whole web of issues. But the second issue is the criminal justice equity issue, which actually is what really is driving this and uh, the concern, not just in New York City or around the state, but even in Westchester studies have shown that if you are picked up for a marijuana offense now, if you are black or Hispanic, you are more likely to be going to jail than if you are white. And that is the reality that everybody acknowledges and one of the things that really advances the issue, because again, we hear from uh, colleagues the stories of lives ruined and it really is based on a discriminatory sort of metric. Uh, so this is what, what we have before us. It's going to come up next year. What we did do is we did lower the penalties for low-level marijuana offenses so that the criminalization, to the extent that it continues to exist, is not as severe as it was. And I think that's sort of half, half of the issue. Just the other half is, so I'm chair of the Senate Education Committee. And I also was very on the fence about legalizing recreational marijuana for adults for many reasons. But one of them was my fear about vaping. Everyone in the school community, the school stakeholders, the school boards, the teachers, the PTA, uh, the superintendents had grave fears that the use of vaping, which is very predominant in our high schools, it is all over our high schools, uh, had risks associated with legalization of recreational marijuana for adults that there somehow would be a way, which we now seem to think is the way, of getting marijuana into the vape and then causing danger. And what's happened now with five deaths and the New York State has taken very strong action and basically discouraged any vaping and I'd like to see us have a temporary halt on vaping and I'm not a fan of the Juul company, no secret about that. but. Uh, we have a real issue with whether the legalization of recreational marijuana is going to contribute or add to the dangers of vaping by young people who are not under the law, they're going to be below the law, but they're going to have accessibility to legal forms of liquid marijuana that can be added to a vape. So for those of you who don't know, it's really like carrying a little mar uh, mascara stick in your pocketbook. It's a little nothing and in there can be uh, potentially a very dangerous additive of some form of something coming out of the marijuana family or the hemp family. So I don't know what we're going to do about it. I think what's happened over the last few weeks with vaping causes us additional concern about legalizing recreational marijuana. There is a very strong community in support of it, but I think um, I, I continue to have grave concerns and, and I think unless we address this vaping issue, uh, I think it's going to be very difficult to move forward as quickly as some of the advocates want. I think it's now 8.30. I think we want to give a lot of time for our audience to ask questions to these two. Uh, it's so rare that we get both of them here at the same time, so I think I'd like to now uh, open it to the audience. Thank you. Uh, one of the major concerns, I think, of people in this community is real estate taxes. And I believe one of the reasons that real estate taxes are so high is New York is unique in having the local communities use real estate taxes to pay for Medicare. This is something that the state could take over and relieve a substantial burden on education, not only here, but in cities like Yonkers and other places. I've heard a lot of things that you've done what are you going to do about that? Yeah, well, so, um, <laughs> two things. Uh, we are one of the few states where localities contribute to the cost of Medicaid. But we, and, and, and you're right, it's a tremendous, tremendous burden on our local property taxpayers. 
so several things. One is we made the property tax cap permanent instead of subject to renewal. That was in, in part because it's become a subject of negotiating and, and tinkering, and we want to put that aside. So that's one thing we did. Two, uh, we have capped the growth of the county's contribution to Medicaid. We did it several years ago, so they could not increase, which isn't to say that it's not extremely expensive and a tremendous burden. We should take over the full cost of Medicaid. I totally agree with you. The question is how do we have the money to do it at the state level? We have to do it gradually. There are a number of proposals to do it. I totally agree with you. It should not be a burden on the property taxpayers. And I think over time we will. I would say this. The governor has a self-imposed spending cap of 2%. It's not a constitutional or statutory requirement. He, it's sort of he, something that he understandably wants to talk about. It's difficult for us to try to spend over that 2% at the state level without running into his objection over going over the 2%. That being said, I agree with you, and I hope we can get there. No, I uh, I'm going to add something that I think our county executive wants to feed in on that issue. Uh, so w here's the question, what does it cost? Uh, the numbers we ran it a couple of years ago, for, uh, for all of Medicaid, the state takeover is probably about uh, two billion outside of New York City, six billion, it has probably gone down for New York City. So it's about $8 billion. I actually think the number is probably closer to seven now because what uh, Shelley mentioned is the state is actually taking over a higher percentage each year because of the Medicaid cap. So how does this get reflected? We've been over the years to press conferences and proposals to actually have the takeover, but it has to fit into the state budget pie. That six billion, or, or if you just did outside of New York City, Two billion has to come from somewhere else, and so that's either coming from healthcare, education. It is. It's not an unlimited pot of, of money. I have long, strongly supported it. Been on proposals for it in the past. And uh, George, do you want to feed in on this issue since it's close? Yeah, I do. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't want to scream into the TV, but be heard in the room. Uh, I think we owe Shelley and Steve a great debt of gratitude because the county put together a... Um, <laughs> this isn't on the Medicaid mandate, which is a legitimate separate area of property tax uh, control. The county put together a plan to rationalize sales tax all across the county, and it had the support of Nancy and the town board and the two village boards, and it was not an easy lift in the state legislature, uh, particularly in the state senate. Both Shelley and Steve had to stand up and although we propose this, anytime you use the T word, it's like touching the third rail, uh, you know, down in the New York City subway system. But we made the argument, the municipal governments, the county government, that if we had additional sales tax revenue done rationally across the county, we would get an infusion of money that would allow us to restrain property taxes. And so with the, uh, you know, the, the support of Shelley and Steve, not just support, the leadership, we were able to, to, uh, to take care of that particular issue in this legislative session, and in so doing, the county now, for the next two years, will freeze property, county property taxes, perhaps lower them, it depends on the, you know, as we get into the budget process, what our expenses are, and although I don't have the numbers in my head, the town of Mamaronick, the village of Larchmont, the village of Mamaronick, the Mamaronick School District, and the Rye Neck School District all got significant uh, amounts of money, and the aggregate I think it's uh, in, in fiscal, the next fiscal year coming ahead, it's uh, $28 million more for municipal governments, $14 million more for school governments. Uh, Catherine Parker and I at the county will worry about the county piece of that. But Shelley and Steve did something very significant in this session to help us with our property tax burden. I didn't know it was coming to me. Uh, thank you so much for that overview. Um, I just wanted to raise two other issues that I wish you would talk about. They're very fundamental. Um, one of them is the Public Finance Commission, which is having its one and only uh, local area uh, here, public hearing today in New York City. Um, and the other is the 2020 Census. If you could talk about both of those, please. 
I'll start with the, the census, which is extremely important for our, our area uh, because uh, census is difficult enough under normal circumstances, but because of what the Trump administration has done to basically scare away uh, immigrant communities from participating in the census, we are at risk of having more of an undercount than we usually have because we have communities that, that share uh, Im immigrant immigrant populations in our in our localities. Uh, in Port Chester, they have a complete count committee. Uh, George is here. The county has a complete count committee, and there are other efforts. There's one that the. So Nancy Sellickson tells us that the the three uh, tri municipality area is going to have a complete count committee. This is a vital piece towards our getting. Uh, uh, proper congressional representation, but there are hundreds of federal programs that are determined by the census count, which is not supposed to be citizens, it's supposed to be inhabitants and uh, a reflection of the actual needs of uh, a community. So let me say on public finance, I think there was a, uh, a fairly strong consensus in both the Assembly, and less so in the Assembly than in the Senate that there's a strong interest in having a some kind of matching system of public funds for campaigns. And the goal would be to allow people who do not have access to money to run for office, because it truly is an impediment, as you know, all of us, or certainly I know firsthand, you have to be able to raise a super large amount of money to be a competitive candidate in some of these races. And it was also to allow new people to participate who may not have access to money. It's, it, it exists in the city of New York. It's not perfect. It has its flaws there. The goal was to find some kind of system that would work. There was reservations by some members from New York City about the flaws in the New York City system. The governor uh, wanted to combine it with some other election reform issues, and so they created a commission. I was not a fan of that. I wish we did not have to do it. Um, we basically, that was the only way we could get move this issue ahead, was to create a commission, which is having this hearing in New York City, to look at a number of issues, including potentially public financing. They are to come back in December with their recommendations. We either accept them or we have to affirmatively go back in December and reject their recommendations. So we'll wait to see what the report says. Unfortunately, I think a number of other controversial election issues will be bunched in with them and, and creating a single vote of the commission. And therefore, I think it will be both contentious and difficult, and I don't know how it's going to work out. I, I'm not a big fan of these commissions. I think they, you elected us. You know, we should make decisions. If you don't like the way we voted, then you should vote us out of office. But instead of deferring to some non-named group. But this was the only way to move the issue ahead. I just say one additional thing about the commissions, and I agree totally with Shelley. Um, I, I, I question, and the legislature has done this over the years in a few different circumstances, where we are delegating actual the actual writing of statutes to commissions. And I, I think that that is our job, and we should take on that responsibility. The idea that uh, we are offloading to a group that is going to write laws that never really go back and have the debate within the elected officials of the legislature, uh, I think is questionable. And I think, I, I think that um, if they go too far afield, I think there will be legal, legal challenges. So the other piece of the issue which um, I'm concerned about is uh, the, the public financing campaign issue uh, does not adequately address or may not address at all the dark money, secret money uh, that affects uh, elections in this state now, money from outside of the state. In Shelley's race, Shelley had, uh, had money coming in, not through our New York State election law process where there's reporting who are the contributors, where did the money come from, but through, because of Citizens United, uh, unnamed money, corporate money from other places to influence elections, and it happens in uh, other races in New York State. It is very concerning, and I think we need to have to find a way to deal with Citizen United or to strengthen, if we can, New York's own laws about independent expenditures needs to be part of it. Uh, 
Hi, help. Does this work? I don't know. Can you hear me? Hi, my name is Steve Shapiro. I'm a resident of Mamaroneck for the past 30 years. My kids grew up and they were on their own, which is a good thing. And um, I'm here with Noel Littner and a few other people. And I don't think Albany knows or has heard the message from the business community about what's going on in New York. But the message that Albany has been giving to the business community is that we're closed for business. And there are a number of instances that have occurred that give that message loud and clear. And I don't think the representatives understand what's going on in New York City. An example is Amazon showed up at our doorstep and was going to bring in 25,000 jobs. And not only were they belittled, they were run out on a rail. The second thing is, you can't get gas hookups in Brooklyn and Queens. So small businesses are not being able to open up. And they're being hurt, which again is an employer, taxes, and so on. Westchester, I'm told, is the same thing with gas hookups, moratorium. So builders can't build, and energy, where it's clean and efficient, they can't. What's happened is the message that all is giving, especially after regulations that just took place, is that you're not interested in growth, you're not interested in expanding, and businesses are leaving. Businesses are laying off people. The new rent regulations that just took place basically does not incentivize any landlord to renovate up housing, multifamily housing in the city. The result is that, I mean, I'm in real estate. I've been in real estate for 40 years. Companies are laying off people. A boiler company had a contract for 32 boilers in the Bronx in December. Brand new high energy efficient boilers, gas operated. The boiler company took the deposit, started working on it. The rent regulations changed. And I don't know if people understand what the rent regulations do, but you're not allowed to pass those costs on any further. So the owner turned around and said, cancel the contract, keep the deposit. Boiler company laid off 10 people. Question is, why is Albany acting in this way? We're the highest tax state in the, in the country, or just about. We're the highest tax state in the county. And then you're giving a message of anti-business. So I think that's mostly directed at me. So I and I'm happy to answer. No, no, no. Understand? On the rent law. That's right. Yes. No. So, no, no. I, I appreciate the question. I think that one of the challenges of being a new Democratic majority is to make sure that people understand that in fact we are not. And you call it Albany, but it's really us that represent you are not anti-business. And I, for one. Uh, have been a longtime supporter of economic growth in all of our communities. That isn't to say we're not going to disagree on some of the things, and I will tell you about some of them that I think we may disagree, some we may agree. Amazon, just in context, um, they spent a year and a half negotiating basically a deal for them. They did not tell really anyone about the deal. They called Andrea Stewart Cousins, the leader of the Senate. We would basically have to approve certain uh, aspects of it the day before they announced it, after negotiating a year and a half. Now, I'm not saying that, saying we won't meet with Amazon or saying that we don't want them under any conditions was what I would have done. It isn't what I would have done. That being said, you have to have the context. It was a billions of dollars that was going to be allocated in a community. And if, you, if it came to Mamaroneck or if it came in my neighborhood, I as an elected official would want to know about it and have some input. So I think the process was poor and needs to be improved. I think it's unfortunate that uh, the whole thing degenerated into, in fact, that Amazon would not even engage after they got sort of so offended by the fact that, welcome to New York, people push back. It's not always easy. Uh, so I think on Amazon, the process was flawed and the outcome was very unfortunate. I agree with you about the outcome was unfortunate. We should not have had that happen. And it wasn't up to me, but on the rent laws. So let me say something about the rent laws, and, and I'm glad you brought it up. 
Some people think the rent thing is only a New York City issue. Uh, between Andrea Stewart Cousins and myself, who only represent Westchester, we had 27,000 rent regulated tenants in our districts. I have the largest Crestwood Lake apartments on Central Avenue. There are tenants there who, for years, no one paid any attention with the prior majority. They had tilted the uh, equation so far in, it, in, in favor of the landlords, there really was no opportunity. Let me give you an example, and I won't get too technical, but for major capital improvements, which what you're talking about in a rent-regulated building, in New York, you could get 6% increase. In Westchester, 15% of the increase. So there was nothing we could do about it. My tenants in my buildings, in my district, were being really unfairly penalized. We, we are not for depriving owners of a right of return on their investment, and we did not take it away. I disagree with how you characterize that. Well, I'll, I'll be glad to talk to you in detail about why we did it. I also met with uh, about 40 of the rent-regulated owners in Westchester at length and heard their arguments. I tried to modify, in fact, we did modify some of the proposals to, away from the original proposals uh, to make it so that there is a return on investment. It's not as much, and we believe we set the equation back towards the middle. I'm not saying there aren't things we should fix, and I'm very open to looking at the impact on co-ops right now, where there may be some unintended consequences, but I. I don't think it's fair to say we are opposed to business. And I, for one, just to give you one more example, I had a bill that would affect retailers in a way that I thought was a legitimate point. But the retail council came to me and said, please do not move this bill because in the face of Amazon, bricks and mortar stores are facing tremendous challenges in selling and anything that increases the cost or creates a problem for them will be a problem. Please don't move your bill. I was a sponsor. I held my bill. I said I need to negotiate with the Retail Council. It passed in the Assembly. Uh, I did that because I want to be someone who is responsive to business, listens to business, doesn't mean we'll always agree, and understands that business is essential for New York. So I'm happy to meet with you and try to find a way that we can find some common ground. I'll be very, very, really briefly on that. I think it's terrible that we lost Amazon, uh, but I also think that it is possible that Amazon was ultimately going to walk under any circumstance. In terms of because they sort of like it, it has to be totally our way, and 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 they they walk. So I don't know what would have happened there, but in terms of New York business climate, we actually won a competition. Amazon chose New York, looking at the business climate, deciding that they they wanted to do business here and then with just the normal opposition of any kind of big development gets the questions they they they, they chose to back off um, in terms of the mci issue i actually think it should have been handled a little differently in the law i am concerned and i think we're gonna have to track it that uh, one problem the old mci system was that mcis were permanent even if the improvement had been paid off but we may have gone, and this is a big bill, we vote on a big bill that has many things into it. I'm concerned that the return is not going to allow for the proper investment in buildings, and I think that we're going to have to track that. I actually passed a business bill, a business-friendly bill, this year that, uh, it, a little arcane, but maybe since you're in the field, you're aware of um, something called the Yellowstone injunctions. You know what the, those are. This is a, I passed a bill um, in 1968, there was a court decision that gave commercial tenants the right to due process before they could have their lease terminated uh, by a, a property owner. Sometimes these things occur where property owners feel if they get a commercial tenant out, they can get a higher pay paying tenant in. And uh, the Court of Appeals in 1968 gave a right to due process before the courts before a lease can be terminated. That decision was overturned by the appellate division two years ago by the Court of Appeals this year. I have a bill that passed both houses that reinstates uh, the, the uh, Yellowstone um, uh, injunctions as an option in these things. And I think it's good for all businesses. In fact, I've heard from lawyers that um, practice for both landlords and tenants in the commercial sphere and they think that it, it's right that at least there's due process. So this is something that came to me as something that was important for small business and I'm very, very proud to have worked hard on 
little arcane, but since you mentioned the, re the real estate world, um, here's a, a pro-business bill that I, I certainly was involved with. Thank you. My name is Jack Rao, and I want to share with you an idea I've been toying with for some time. And most recently, I had a conference call with the, our senator and assemblyman who gave me some excellent ideas, suggestions, advice, counsel. And before that, I spent some time with our beloved county exec, George Latimer there, who gave me also excellent advice. And before that, I spent some time with... Question. Yeah. The question is, the idea, first of all, the idea is to provide access to I-95 North from Larchmont at the Weaver and Harmon Drive. Instead of dra it takes about 17 to 18 traffic lights to go through Palmer Avenue or Post Road to Mamaroneka Avenue. Spends 15 to 20 minutes to get there. I brought up this idea about 10 months ago and to the town and the issues were, I believe the challenges were technical and traffic. What I'm requesting the town to do is to do a feasibility study now in terms of the traffic patterns, traffic analysis, and the cost benefit, how feasible it is so that the, after this study, it can go up to the county, state, and the federal level. That's Yes. I-95 North, from, yeah, from Weaver and Harmon Drive. There are no houses there. Yeah, yeah, okay. It really is something that the, the villages and the town have to work out and see whether it's something they would be supportive of or not. I have a question. Sorry. Uh, it's a, a pro-business question. What is the uh, state doing to encourage solar, uh, wind, and other kinds of uh, things? Also, there's uh, pro-business is the small, tiny people, sorry, uh, small people or new people uh, in these uh, uh, re re renting space to start a business. Uh, and the, the engine of the small business is not Amazon, but people, creative people, uh, working in spaces. What is the state doing to encourage that kind of service? Thank you. Well, on the, uh, first on the solar and wind, I mean, the state has approved a very significant wind project off the coast of Long Island, uh, bigger than probably any other state on the East Coast. Uh, they've begun the process of developing it. Uh, I know I was on a trip to Denmark to see how uh, Denmark has basically taken the industry of wind and made it a source of job growth, job development, scientific development. And um, so I'm very optimistic about wind development. Solar, I think, uh, I frankly think New York has been behind the times. It has not created enough uh, incentives, both for schools, for uh, companies, and for homes, and we're going to continue to push forward on that. We have incentives, but it is a difficult process to get financing. We used to have more on-bill financing for solar. Uh, we have restricted the use of that. I think that we need a much more global investment in uh, solar and wind. I'll just let Steve answer the other part. I think. Well, so I mean, you know, I mean, this is something that the 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 market is actually encouraging. If I if I think I understand your question, there are entities like WeWorks or other kinds of entities that are really taking off. I mean, they are actually uh, popular uh, stocks that people can buy because of the flexibility that especially startups need to have a a space that can grow or contract with their business. So. I actually think that is flourishing right now, um, especially in Manhattan, but even here in Westchester, there are that, that kind of model I is doing well. Hi, my name is Pat Haggerty. I'm, uh, I'm new to the area in like the last four or five years, 
Uh, I've had a lot of help already from the, the elected officials like George helped me with the charity event here in Larchmont. I've had a fantastic experience. For the people that are kind of new to the community, like me, that are migrating here from the city with kids, what are a couple of, aside from voting obviously, what are a couple of things that you could use from this community to help you with the biggest challenges that you have? I'm not sure I understand the question. Oh, you want to help? What can we help you with? Oh, I, I can say the, uh, I know. well, I would, I, would, I would say this. I am always looking for ideas for legislation. And so I go, you see me at lots of events, and you see Shelly at lots of events, and George is everywhere. The way we do our job, George is, George is awesome. the, the way we do our job, is we hear about problems that we wouldn't hear about otherwise because people come to us and raise these issues. And it may be an issue that's bothering you, and you may not realize that that might be a piece of legislation that we can research and work on. But right now, we are retooling in my office, and I, I have uh, two members of my staff here. I want to give a shout out to Verena Arnibal um, and Lisa Urban. Is Lisa still here? Where's Lisa? Way over there, who are in my district office and I have a person in the Albany office, we're working on new ideas for legislation. A lot of that comes from people like yourself and constituents, things that you bring us a problem and we see if there's a more global issue involved with it. We're working on a, a variety of privacy related issues, which is sort of a, a cutting, air, cutting edge issue area nationwide and some important things. So that is uh, the biggest way you can help us. But I would also say one thing about Large Mount Maranac and all the communities in the Sound Shore, um, we all help each other because there are so many not-for-profits and causes that you can be, be involved with, with your family, volunteering, be on boards, and it is, there is just such life here, and we're spoiled because it isn't true everywhere, doesn't have the community fabric that we have on the Sound Shore. I think that was a good way to end our uh, discussion. I just, this can oh, I just sorry, say one sorry. quick thing? Sure. Two things. Sorry. One, as a parent of children, if they're in the school, as the chair of education, it's very important that we hear from parents in communities that are doing well. Their district is doing well in terms of outcome. The parents are generally satisfied because we want to create enough flexibility so that you're not hampered by regulations of SED. And so, to the extent that there are school issues, whether through the parents or another, it's very important. Secondly, to the point raised earlier, if you hear that an issue is going to be on the horizon, like in January the governor's gonna put out his budget and he's gonna put all these ideas in them, before we vote, if you have an opinion, please either email or call or ask for a meeting. It's very important that we hear from you before we get to the final product where the language is already set. And I think Steve and I both pride ourselves on being very open. I would say one of the wonderful things about this community is highly informed, it's highly activist with opinions, and we are the beneficiaries of getting those opinions. The earlier you hear about something, even if you don't have to know everything, shoot me an email and I will do my best to respond. Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming. We, I want to shout out for Catherine Parker. We didn't uh, acknowledge her presence too, our county, but right. <laughs> We have so many representatives here this morning that we're really very grateful. We're grateful to our senator and our assembly person for uh, coming and sharing all of this and for all of you coming and sharing your concerns with all of us. Our next meeting is October 8th. We're now on a second Tuesday of the month schedule. I'm so glad that all of you knew, knew that and came today. Uh, the, co the topic of our next meeting will be the background on the murals. You've all seen these murals all over the area. We're going to let you know how and why they were produced, uh, how the artists were done, and why uh, it's an important addition to our community. So we'll see you next month, October 8th. Thank you all for coming.